And now, breaking news from ESPN 630. I'm sure this is not going to come as shocking breaking news for you, but the news has broken within the last half hour that Ron Rivera is out as coach and the team is moving on. The stunning part of this is who's moving in. Now, we don't know who the new coach is going to be, and we probably won't know that for some time. But this is something that, and I go back to 31 years ago when Joe Gibbs retired for the first time, to when Richie Pettibone was fired, to when Norv Turner was fired, to when Steve Spurrier resigned, to when Marty Schottenheimer was fired. I mean, I've been through so many of these, but I've never seen anything like this. And this is what is being reported by ESPN. It's more than reported because it's confirmed by the team with statements. But I'll read you uh, some of the opening paragraph in the sweeping overhaul of a franchise leadership that started with the dismissal of Coach Ron Rivera Monday morning. Washington Commanders owner Josh Harris has hired two prominent executives, ex-Golden State Warriors general manager Bob Myers and ex-Minnesota Vikings GM Rick Spielman to assist his ownership group with searches of a new for a new head of football operations and a head coach, franchise officials told ESPN. Now, these are names that have been thrown around. It's not the first time I've heard Bob Meyer's name associated with this team, but it's happening. Now, it's important to recognize here, doesn't mean that Bob Myers is going to be based in Ashburn running the team day to day. Uh, I don't think that's what's going to happen. These are advisors to Josh Harris and his group, Mitch Rails, Magic Johnson, David Blitzer, the prominent, most prominent part of the ownership group. They are going to be speaking with these two guys, and they will be advising them on who to hire. Uh, I don't know what this means for Jason Wright. I would imagine that uh, he will be reviewed as well by this new group. Uh, and I don't know what it means for who will ultimately be the general manager of the team. Doesn't sound like it's going to be Rick Spielman. They're looking for a new coach and a new head of football operations. Now, the head of football operations could also be the same person who's the general manager, or it could be someone who hires a general manager. And I would think that before they hire a head coach and the clock is different than it used to be when Ron Rivera took over four years ago. Remember, he was hired January 2nd with Dan Snyder wishing everybody a happy Thanksgiving that day. So uh, things are different now. You you don't have the ability to move as quickly as you used to. And it's not going to be until after the divisional playoffs that you can start to hire coaches. So that's going to be another couple of weeks here. And a lot can happen in a, in a couple of weeks. We've already had Arthur Smith fired as coach of the Atlanta Falcons. There's probably going to be three or four more today. Who knows what the future is going to be for Bill Belichick in New England, whether he resigns, whether he's traded, whether he's fired, who knows. But there are going to be openings, and there's going to be competition for the top coaches. And now I think this steps up as a very attractive job, I would think. I mean, even though Bob Meyer's background is in basketball – he was incredibly successful at Golden State. They went to six finals. They won four championships. He hired Steve Kerr, who's going to be a Hall of Fame coach. Uh, he was head of the operation when they were smart enough to draft Steph Curry, I believe, at seven, and Clay Thompson at number 11, you know, the backbone of that team. They took Draymond Green in the second round, and they had their big three without having to go crazy in the lottery. And... That's not to say that his expertise in building a championship basketball team is going to translate to football, but this is so much different than it was during the Dan Snyder era where we routinely had coaches fired and all you had to do was look around for the biggest name available and Snyder was going to chase him with money. And as far as a general manager went, well, he stayed with that boob Vinny Serrato for 11 years, saw Marty Schottenheimer fire him, brought him back, and then – when we thought that he was moving in the direction of being an adult, he brought in Bruce Allen, who proved to be devious, underhanded, uh, slimy. He got rid of him. He brings in Ron Rivera, and look, it, Ron Rivera's a good man. There's no question about it. And he walked into an impossible situation that became more impossible once he took over. 
He didn't know that COVID was coming. He didn't know that the Washington Post was going to unleash this investigation into the culture that Dan Snyder had created that would ultimately lead to him selling the team. He didn't know that he was going to get cancer, that he was going to have to battle through in his first year. He didn't know that that Dwayne Haskins uh, was never going to be a quarterback here and what he had, what he had available to him was never going to work out. I mean, he, he didn't know these things and things just got worse and worse. And to his credit, you know, he he never lashed out at the media. Uh, he kept a, a, basically a calm demeanor. There were a couple of times that he, he blew up. He made some terrible personnel decisions. And ironically, he walked in the door with the second pick of the draft, and he walks out the door leaving the second pick of the draft behind with no real answer at quarterback. Um, you know, maybe Sam Howell develops into a pretty good quarterback. I don't think he's a franchise quarterback. And there will now be some new people making the decisions as to uh, how much – of the future Sam Howell has here and who's going to be coming in to compete with him. I would be shocked if with a second pick, they don't take a quarterback and you know, it's, it's quite possible that uh, the quarterback who comes in here could be the same quarterback who replaced Sam Howell at the university of North Carolina. I mean, we're a long way from that. That's in April. A lot of things have to happen, including the evolution of this front office. But uh, this is more from the ESPN story, which is reported by Adam Schefter and Adrian Wojnarowski, an NBA insider and an NFL insider. Uh, Harris will be intimately involved in the search process, but his longstanding relationship with Myers, a two-time NBA executive of the year, evolved in recent months and convinced the owner that Myers' championship pedigree and industry relationships could play a significant role in building out Washington's new NFL leadership structure. The commander's current front office, including general manager Martin Mayhew and executive vice president of football player personnel Marty Herney, will remain on staff through the search process, officials said. The new head coach of football operations, the new head of football operations and head coach will determine their long term futures with the commanders. Um, I don't think either one of them is going to stay, but it's been interesting to hear some of the reporting recently that that Marty Herney has developed a relationship with Josh Harris. Now he may stay in the organization in some capacity. I I can't imagine that Martin Mayhew stays. Uh, I would think Marty Herney may be involved in scouting. I don't know. That'll be up to whoever is the head of football operations, but uh, I, I wouldn't read into this any other than they're just going to make changes now and, and wait for the, the more uh, granular changes that have to come down the line. Um, Harris released a statement, so this is not just reported by ESPN, but it's now official. Uh, Harris said in a statement to ESPN, this is a crucial offseason for us. We won't shy away from the work needed to get back to the place where we can deliver a winning culture top to bottom. I've known Bob, Bob Myers, a long time and watched him construct four championship teams in a highly successful organization in Golden State. He is innovative, thoughtful, well-connected across sports, and understands what it takes to solidify and sustain championship infrastructure. I think he's going to be incredibly additive. Meyer stepped down as GM of the Warriors in June, uh, goes through his, his record of winning championships, and then Myers released a statement uh, through ESPN, and he's working for ESPN now. I, I, I don't know whether he's going to continue that. Um, you know, he's is, does he go through the finals? I don't know. I don't know how this works. But he said about Josh Harris, I've been fortunate to know Josh Harris for many years, and his commitment to building championship caliber teams is what drew me here. In my experience, championship infrastructure begins with a strong ownership group that prioritizes culture and invest in attracting the industry's most talented and innovative leaders. This is the type of opportunity that really inspires me, and I look forward to contributing to the next chapter of this storied franchise. Uh, Spielman had been the Vikings GM for nine years, left in 2021, 30 years of front office experience. Again, I, I would it does not sound like Rick Spielman is going to become the GM of the team. I think he's going to be in an advisory capacity, and he will try to hire somebody uh, after 30 years. I don't know if he wants to go through another startup here. And I'm trying to think of, of comps on this, of, of guys who have been successful in one sport and moved on to another. The, the one that comes to mind, and I'd have to do some research to tell you how it completely worked out, but it, it, in the long run, it did not. Uh, Bo Schembechler, after he retired from coaching at the University of Michigan, 
became an executive with the Detroit Tigers for a while, and it may have been only like a year. Um, I don't know if there are other examples of executives in one sport moving on to another and being successful. But I can tell you this, it's hard to argue with what he did with the Warriors. And from what has been described by people who cover the NBA, like David Aldridge, he's a great people person. Well, that's that's a big part of it, you know, knowing what people to hire, the right people, leading those people. So, I mean, at this point, you have to look at this as a home run. Now, down the road, we may be sitting here whining six, eight months from now. Oh, God, they brought in a basketball guy, and look how he's running things. You know, he, he thinks he's trying to land, you know, the next Kevin Durant or something like No, I, I, I mean, it, it, there are things about this that could be criticized. But he also knows he's stepping into an organization that's been a dumpster fire for years. Uh, and and including this year under the Josh Harris group, they did what they could, but they didn't take over until a week before training camp. They weren't going to fire Ron Rivera at that point. They weren't going to have a new general manager. They had to let this play out this year and had to observe and had to develop a learning curve and had to, you know, boost up the, the, the confidence of the fans. And they didn't do it with what they did on the field, the 4-13 and record is the worst they've had since 1961 when they finished 112 and 1 with an all white team the last all white team in the history of sports um and and so it's it's a bad product that has was on the field yesterday in that 38 to 10 loss to Dallas but um i i, I would have to applaud this i don't i don't think you can really look at this as having a downside and again it does not sound like Josh Harris is going to be employing these guys to run the football team. They are going to advise him on who to hire. And in the meantime, they haven't done anything but oust Ron Rivera. Now, there'll be a new coach who will come in, and I don't. I think only Eric Bieniemy is under contract for next year. So I guess Bieniemy will have an opportunity to be interviewed, and I don't even know if he's going to want to do it because – uh, part of the Rooney rule is you have to hire, you have to uh, interview African American candidates. And Eric Bieniemy has been through that dog and pony show a bunch of times, and he may say to them, "Look, I know I'm not going to get this job, so I'm not just going to be your your guy to fill your your Rooney rule requirement." Uh, it it could go that way, but right now the only person who is out is Ron Rivera, and you know that that should be a, a, of no surprise to anyone. His record here. 26, 40, and 1, uh, right along the lines of most of the four-year coaches who have been here. Uh, Joe Gibbs had a losing record uh, while he was here. He was 30 and, f- and 34, uh, made the playoffs twice, actually won a playoff game, which was the last one that they won back in 2005. Um, and, and generally, the, the turn and burn of Snyder has, has pretty much gone this way. Um, and... And I, I, I look at what Ron Rivera walked into and what he saw as an opportunity, which I think all coaches want. Ron Rivera had been fired in Carolina by an owner who's turning out to be the next Dan Snyder without all the, uh, all the office Michigas. And, uh, and, and he saw an opportunity here to do what most coaches want to do, the Bill Parcells line, if – if they want me to cook the meal, they ought to let me shop for the groceries. And there wasn't any other place in the NFL where that was going to happen. He looked at the dumpster fire here, and he said, I can go to Dan Snyder, and I can say, Dan, I can run things for you. You're going to have to let me do it, but I'll be the one who heads up this operation. And after Snyder wished everybody a happy Thanksgiving, I think either he released a statement or or maybe even – you know, he doesn't like to be interviewed, but did did say a couple of things along the lines of, well, this is a coach centric operation and this is the way things are going in the league. Well, it might go that way for Bill Belichick, but it wasn't going to go that way for Ron Rivera because, as he proved, he was a good coach at some point, good enough to get the Carolina Panthers to the Super Bowl with Cam Newton, but he wasn't a good CEO. And he even said last week, and I'll I'll play that comment for you coming up, uh, where he said, you know, last week, I spent the first three and a half years as an administrator, and finally I've been able to coach. 
Well, that didn't work out so well either. <laughs> they haven't won a game since he took over as defensive coordinator. They close out the season with eight straight losses. Their last win was over two months ago against the New England Patriots. So as we autopsy this, there are many things to consider here. And we have to consider that in the circumstance that Ron Rivera was in over four years, I don't know how successful anybody would have been. But with his experience and with his abilities, as we saw, good man, good person, good human being, but not a good administrator, not a good judge of talent, not very good as being a CEO of an entire operation. Probably was a very good defensive coordinator, good enough to get a head coaching job, good enough to take a team to a Super Bowl, but in the end, that's what he was. You know, the old Peter principle. You rise to your level of incompetence, and his incompetence was trying to run an entire operation in the chaotic environment that existed here. And, and there are, I, I bet there are some who would have walked away from this, who would have just said, I don't need this. Hey, he'd be walking away from a lot of money, and he's getting a nice little parachute as he walks out the door. He's probably going to collect, I don't know, six or seven million dollars not to coach next year. But if, if he came here with the intention of doing what is pretty much the impossible in the NFL, you know, there, there are, are so few men who have been able to, to run the whole show, and even Bill Belichick, minus Tom Brady, not successful. Not successful. So, um, again, with what we experienced here over the last four years, you know, somebody had to have their hand on the rudder, and it might as well have been Ron Rivera. But in the end, it was too much for one person and too much particularly for this person who walks out the door leaving behind essentially the same mess that was here when he got here. So we'll talk more about this throughout the morning. Tony's got a show coming up at 11 o'clock. I don't know if it was recorded early enough to get some of this information out, but I'll have plenty to say over the next hour and 40 minutes. So stay with us. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. All right, we got Tony coming up at 11 o'clock. Meantime, lots to talk about with the changes going on in Ashburn today. I'm sure you're aware by now that Ron Rivera has been fired. The stunning news, though, today is that Josh Harris, who built the four championship team, or Josh Harris, hired the man who built four championship teams with the Golden State Warriors, Bob Myers, a basketball guy, hired along with former Vikings GM Rick Spielman to assist the ownership group with searches for a new head of football operations and a new head coach. Uh, What their day-to-day involvement is going to be with the team, we don't know. But right now they're assembling an advisory panel with some with some chops, some guys who have had uh, great resumes, uh, one of them in another sport. Uh, the ownership group did release a statement today, and unlike the slimy two-sentence statements that used to come from Dan Snyder and or Bruce Allen when they would fire a coach, and Allen famously saying when he fired Jay Gruden, the culture is damn good. Um, This was what Josh Harris said in a lengthy statement today. I'm going to read you it. The, The team just put it out. As a release, uh, Harris saying, today we made the decision to part ways with Ron Rivera. I want to thank Ron and his wife, Stephanie, for all they did for the commanders and the DMV community, especially during the ownership transition. Ron helped navigate this organization through some challenging times. He is a good and thoughtful leader who positively contributed to this organization and the NFL. I wish the Rivera family nothing but the best moving forward. Classy. Paragraph two. As we looked ahead, we recognized the results this season were not good enough and a strategic shift in leadership and approach is necessary. Alongside my partners, I have assembled a small advisory committee to assist me in identifying two important roles for the organization, head of football operations and head coach. I asked Mitch Rails, Irvin Magic Johnson, and David Blitzer, as well as Bob Myers and Rick Spielman, to join the advisory committee that will work with me to make the best decisions for the franchise, to deliver upon our ultimate of becoming an elite franchise and consistently competing for the Super Bowl. There is a lot to do first, and we must establish a strong organizational infrastructure led by the industry's best and most talented individuals. 
As such, we will conduct a thorough search process to ensure we find the right candidates to guide this franchise forward. I consider these decisions to be among the most critical I make for the franchise, attracting exceptional talent, empowering them to lead, and holding them accountable. I look forward to being personally involved throughout the process. This is a crucial offseason for the Commanders, and we continue to be motivated and inspired by the way the fans have responded since we took ownership last summer. Stewarding this franchise is a responsibility we don't take lightly, and we're eager to lay the foundation for the next chapter of Commanders football. Well put. That's the best written statement we have seen from this organization, probably going back to the firing of Richie Pettibone in this this nature when you fire a coach. Usually it's it's just ham-handed, it's sloppy. Uh there there it just it just speaks of an organization that stunk. And uh very impressed with uh, what Josh Harris put out there. Um we have not yet heard from Ron Rivera. I I have not seen anything yet whether or not there's going to be a news conference. I know that when he was fired in Carolina over four years ago, there was a news conference. He wanted to talk to reporters. I would imagine he'll do that. Uh, he, there's locker clean-out going on right now with the team. I'll, I'll try and check on Twitter and see what the uh, beat reporters are saying about the players' reaction to this. But uh, we have not yet heard anything from Ron Rivera on this. But, uh, again, this, this stunning news that they are hiring a basketball executive, Bob Myers, and uh, former Vikings GM Rick Spielman to advise them in uh, making the next hire. Uh, this is some of from yesterday, uh, some of it predictable. They uh, they did what they had to do, and everything fell into place for them yesterday. They didn't get the, the big assist from the Patriots in, in beating the Jets, but because of uh, the other games that took place, most importantly, New Orleans beating Atlanta, and uh, and then that led to uh, Arthur Smith being fired. I think, think he was out by midnight last night acted like a real jerk after the game uh, and, and he's gone so he was the first to go and they're going to be more and then Rivera uh, this morning but this was Rivera last night after the 38-10 loss to the Cowboys uh, asked this question by Scott Abraham of ABC7. Just walking off that field any reflection there I mean not knowing what's not next? Really. You know again I, there's only so much I can control and so when uh you know, we get an opportunity to visit tomorrow. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll have a conversation and go from there. How about this team going forward? Obviously, this year didn't work out. Why should fans be optimistic about kind of the pieces that are in place going forward? Well, I think there's, there, there's enough quality young players in, the, in that room. I really do. Um, but I will say one thing is that, you know, what, what Mr. Harris is doing with this group of, of, of investors coming in and, and, and really, you know, spending the the, the the time, the effort, the money to do things the right way, you know, and that's one of the pluses and one of the positives. You know, it's a very passionate fan base, and their expectations are big. And I think these are the kind of people that can come in and lead that. And so this is this is what I, I think that you should be excited about. It's because I really do. I mean, you're going to go through some hard times. It ain't going to be easy. That's just the way it is. And this was not one of those easy times. But there's a lot of learning and a lot of growing that have gone on. And, you know, if, if there is one thing I, I really do think, uh, this ownership group is just as passionate as this fan base. Uh, they want to win. And that's something that was always made clear to me and one thing that Mr. Harris has always stu- stood by. And so I got a lot of respect for that. Um, you know, they were always up front. They are always honest. So, again, I just look forward to the conversation tomorrow. And the conversation has taken place. Ron Rivera has been relieved of his duties, and we move on with uh, a new front office structure. A couple of things to unpack from yesterday. Uh, again, I think everything that needed to be accomplished was accomplished, including the loss to the Cowboys. Did they have to lose like they did? No, but they're just not a very good team. And and the Cowboys were anxious to load up on some stats, too. They kept C.D. Lamb out there a little longer than I thought they needed to. Dak Prescott was on the field in the fourth quarter when this game was out of hand. But I don't blame him. I mean, it was like an all-you-can-eat buffet for stats, so why not accumulate them if you can? Uh, the one stat that was important, though, and uh, it was coming down to the end of the game, and it looked like they weren't going to get it. And, and fortunately, uh, Dallas kicked a field goal – uh, which which was an important field goal because uh, because w- what happened was their 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 kicker 
Aubrey, who had not missed a kick going into the game, had one blocked and he missed one. And so at the end of the game, just to make sure he was back on track, they had him kick a 50-yarder with a minute six to go, which was good because that gave the commanders just enough time to complete a 15-yard pass to Terry McLaurin, who need, needed 13 yards to reach 1,000, becoming the first Washington receiver in history to have four straight 1,000-yard receiving years with this group of quarterbacks. You know, when you think of the great receivers of the past, you think of Charlie Taylor, who had Sonny Jurgensen almost his entire career. You think of Art Monk, who caught passes from, well, really good quarterbacks, not Hall of Fame quarterbacks, but Joe Theismann and Mark Rippon and, and Doug Williams. Um, and, and then you think of Terry McLaurin, who's had, you know, he's had guys walking in off the street to play quarterback. He had Mr. Butt Fumble quarterbacking him. So to get him four straight 1,000-yard seasons is quite an accomplishment. And, uh, and when you listen to Sam Howell, uh, you get an idea of how the players all feel about Terry McLaurin. Terry is someone that you know means a lot to me, means a lot to this team, this organization, and he's just such a great person, um, great teammate, great friend, um, and he's always had my back throughout this year ever, and even last year too. He's just always had my back, and you couldn't ask for a better teammate than Terry McLaurin. Um, so he deserves it. Um, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't have t- taken this long, but it is what it is, but definitely super happy for him, and he definitely deserves it. Yeah, and he had one game where he had only three targets from Hal and uh, didn't catch a pass. So this was big, and he, for the fourth straight year, uh, has been named – the I don't know what the exact term for it is, but the media picks the the number one player, the most I guess uh, media friendly player. I forget what the title of it, but they make it a donation in his honor, and he got it for the fourth straight year. He stands in his locker, answers questions, no matter how bad things are. Um, and I think one day it's going to wind up being mayor of the city or, or CEO of some company. He's got it. He's just got it. And uh, in expressing his gratitude, look, <laughs> the poor guy. I mean, he makes a lot of money. Okay, we don't need to we don't need to hold the benefit from Terry for Terry McLaurin, but a receiver of his skill level um, should be with a team that has more success. And because of this dysfunction of the organization, and because of the poor job that Rivera and his group did in picking players around him, uh, he's been playing for teams that are bad. And this one was the worst of all at four and thirteen but uh, was very gracious to have the opportunity to uh, reach that mark four straight seasons of 1,000 yards and catches. You know, I'm fortunate to uh, be a part of this organization where there's so many great players, so many great receivers who have contributed to the legacy of this organization. And I've gotten the pleasure to meet some of them. And so to be in the conversation with any of them is a, is a blessing. I honestly didn't know that uh, that would be part of my journey, but I'm, I'm just extremely grateful where God has me. And just to say something about my teammates, you know, it, Basically came down to the last play, and literally everybody on the sideline was like, we're going to get this for you. We're going to block our ass off for you. Um, and it kind of made me a little emotional because I think uh, it's a testament to the guys that we have in this locker room, and I think it's a testament to hopefully how they feel about me and um, the leader that I've tried to be for them. I've tried to put all my all on the table for them each and every day, um, whether it's advocating for us as a team with the coaches or just out there on the field encouraging guys who are down, or trying to keep the energy going. So for them to uh, want to give their all for me to have a record um, when we're not really playing for anything, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that from them. That's, that's really what's going to stick with me, for the, the love that the coaches and my teammates have for me to get me uh, in, in history. So I'm, I'm indebted to them for that, and uh, I'm just thankful for God that he allowed me to be in this situation and uh, uh, be a, a leader for this team and organization. Complete mensch. Just, just, uh, you can't say enough good things about Terry McLaurin. He's, he's young enough to be my son. I'm very proud of my son. I would be proud to have him as a son. I think most people uh, my age would feel that way. Uh, some more from Rivera from yesterday. Again, we wait to hear from him today. I, I'm, I'm checking Twitter just to see maybe did he release a statement. I uh, haven't seen anything so far, but uh, I would not be surprised if he uh, if he does hold the news conference at, at some point. Um, but this is Rivera on the autopsy of the season and asked yesterday, basically, when did it die? You know, you know, going back and looking at the at, at the self scout and just looking at how certain numbers started to show up, um, and and I honestly would have to say it was probably the uh, the first Philadelphia game. After that, there was a little bit of a stretch where there were some things that you know, looking at it analytically, that pointed in the wrong direction. Um, 
And then once we got past New England, we just never really bounced back. Okay, just to refresh your memory, do you remember when the, the first Philadelphia game was? Remember that? Think, think in your mind. The first Philadelphia game was week four. They opened the season with two wins. Okay, they beat a bad Arizona team in the opener and barely 20 to 16. Then they went to Denver, which was in full dysfunctional mess. I think a week later they gave up 70. And they managed to hang on and win that game 35 to 33, though Denver <laughs> managed to hit a hail. Remember this? They hit a hail Mary pass at the end of the game. And Washington made what was a controversial play on the two-point conversion. There could have been pass interference. It wasn't called, and they escaped with a 35-33 win. They're 2-0. and Then the Bills come to town, and the Bills had struggles of their own this year, but not in week three. They beat them 37-3. to And it was like, okay, let's just throw that out. You know, like you, you take a series of quizzes during a year, during a class, and you throw out your lowest score. And you go to Philadelphia, they lost in overtime, 34-31. They did not win the game. And that's what they were hanging their hat on for that rest of the season. Like, hey, we walked out of Philadelphia. We almost won defending NFC champs. Well, you can talk about analytics and numbers. Well, how about these numbers? The Chicago Bears, who were winless and about to fire their coach, Matt Eberflus, they were they were in the Hindenburg. They came in here on a Thursday night and completely embarrassed them. 40 to 20. It could have been 40 to nothing. Washington was terrible in that game. Then they go to Atlanta and they win a game on the road. Well, you saw what happened to Atlanta yesterday against New Orleans. They weren't a good team. And Arthur Blank couldn't wait to fire his coach Arthur Smith before the clock struck midnight. Arthur Smith was out the door, so that was a that was a bad team, and they won that game. So they had now a record of three and three, and you're thinking, okay, you know, a oh, win on the road. Eh, it's tough to win on the road, you know. Maybe they got their bearings back here. They put up 24 points. Okay, they played at the Giants the following week. Giants were a dumpster fire, and the Giants. I think that's the game where they sacked Sam Howell six times, seven times, maybe nine times, whatever it was. It was awful, 14-7. to seven. John at, Jonathan Allen, who doesn't normally do these kind of things, had an expletive-filled you know, rant before he left the locker room filled with F-bombs. After that game, they lose 14-7. to seven. Then they play the Eagles at home, and it's like, oh, well, we played the Eagles close again. Yeah, 38-31. Well, we've seen what the Eagles are doing now. They're in complete free fall. They, they, they drop like, a, like you've shot an eagle out of the sky. Uh, and then they win their last game of the year. At New England, that's two months ago, 20-17. to 17, They barely won against the New England team that had the same record they did. They stunk, too. And then, okay, close game with Seattle, but they lost. Not close game with the Giants, with Tommy DeVito playing quarterback, 31-19. to 19. And then, oh, God, Thanksgiving, Cowboys 45, Commanders 10, Dolphins at home. Miami wins 45 to 15. They uh, go to the Rams, okay, relatively competitive against the Rams, 28 to 20. Against a bad Jets team, they found a way to lose. And actually, if they'd have kept Sam Howell in the game, this would have been a blowout. Jacoby Brissett actually played pretty well, and, and Brissett had, had made it relatively close against the Rams. But with Sam, they weren't doing anything, so they lost those two games. And then, you know, the last two games, what do you expect? 49ers, uh, you know, they covered easily. It was, what, 13 and a half, so they won 27 to 20. And then yesterday, 38 to 10. And remember, you know, what we said about Sam Howell at midseason. Well, maybe they got their guy, you know? Maybe, maybe, at least in this losing season, they've developed a quarterback. And we kept referring back to this preseason quote from Ron Rivera about his future, what he said to John Kime back in August. Quote, I don't worry about that. If we go 8-8-1 eight, eight and one this year and he fires me, well, 8-8-1 eight, eight and one was his high mark <laughs> over his four years, and if he fires me, which he did today, and the next year they win the division and 40 of the 53 players we drafted and it's the same quarterback, I'm vindicated. Send me my Super Bowl ring. Well, first of all, Ron, uh, 
you're not going to have 40 of your 53 drafted players on the roster. That ain't happening. And the same quarterback may be on the roster. I can't imagine that Sam Howell goes into next year as the starter. And send me my Super Bowl ring? Well, it ain't going to be for a while. I think the, these guys recognize that, that it's going to take some time. Uh, this is Sam Howell on what happened with him, what happened with his season, and I'll give you the numbers on his free fall in a moment here, but this was Howell yesterday on uh, why this season never took off for him. The consistency that we needed you know, to be a winning football team wasn't there, you know, and I thought we, we showed some, you know, flashes of, of good football at times throughout the season throughout in, in some games and then it just wasn't we weren't doing it at a consistent enough level to where it was translating into, into wins um, and I think that's really what it comes down to uh, we, didn't, we didn't play good enough we didn't play winning football um, and you know this this is what you get yeah and what you got was a quarterback who looked pretty good at the middle of the season and regressed so they didn't build a quarterback this year if, if this was all about developing a quarterback that was an abject failure. Now here's uh, the numbers from Barry's Verluga's column today. Uh, the seven-game finishing kick, the last seven games of the year, all started by Sam Howell, though he was benched going into the 49ers game and only played because Brissett uh, was injured in practice, if he was. I, I think that's dubious. I think I think it's possible that Brissett said, oh, I got enough here on tape to get a nice contract next year. I'm not, I'm not going out into this meat grinder of uh, San Francisco and Dallas. But uh, the finishing kick here for Sam Howell, last seven games, 124 for 215. That's a completion percentage of 57.7. That's not good enough. You got to be 65 plus in today's game. An average of 166 passing yards, four touchdowns, 12 interceptions. That's a ratio you don't want. And he, by the way, threw more interceptions than any other quarterback in the league this year, threw 21 of them. So 21 touchdowns, 21 interceptions. And uh, Zeruluga writes, when he could have secured a spot in the conversation about who the starter should be in 2024, he removed himself with this play. And also the sacks, 65 uh, in this century. Uh, David Carr has had more twice, 2002 2005, and in the past decade, only two quarterbacks have thrown more than Howell's 21 interceptions. So um, it didn't happen. And that's not to say that Sam Howell can't be on the roster next year. He's very cheap. He's going to make like a million two next year. Uh, and I don't think it would it would destroy his career if if another quarterback comes in and is given every opportunity to start. Heck, if it works out with Jacoby Brissett, bring him back too. You know, you got a, a veteran backup who's proven to be a good mentor, and you bring in the guy who you think might have a chance to be the guy, and I'll play what Ron Rivera said about that uh, this past week, about how important it is to have that guy. But they don't have him now, and it, it, it's, it's clearly not number 14. And it may be Drake May. It may be Kayla Williams. It may be somebody else. It may be Michael Penix who plays tonight. Who knows? But the quarterback of the future, at least the near future, you know, and who knows how things happen. Guys get injured. Things churn and burn and guys get other opportunities. You know, maybe at some point it, it works out that two, three years down the road, we have Sam Howell as the starting quarterback. And we look back on 2023 and saying, oh, my God, what happened to him at the end of the season? I didn't think he'd come back from that. But he did. And those things happen in the NFL. We shall see. Much more reaction to the firing of Ron Rivera, the restructuring of the front office, what's next, reaction from the locker room, all those things. We'll hit that as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. We've been rolling pretty much on the same subject for the last hour. We'll continue it for another hour. Tony's coming up at 11 o'clock. I uh, don't know how much information he had when he did the show, so... I don't know what kind of react we'll get from him today. But as a matter of fact, he's doing a show tomorrow. So uh, we'll get Tony's take on this for sure tomorrow. And I'm sure it'll be one of the top stories on PTI tonight. The uh, end of the Ron Rivera era, the four years. And boy, when you think about coaching tenures here, they were all rocky under Dan Snyder, you know, from the highs and the low of Mike Shanahan over really a two-year period the great RG3 year of 2012, followed by the bottoming out from 2013. Jay Gruden got him to the playoffs once. In fact, he got him there with Scott McLuhan as the general manager. Uh, things are changing in that regard, um, that this team has operated either with 
a ridiculous joke of a general manager like Vinny Serrato or a team president like Bruce Allen or, in the case of Ron Rivera, the coach who got to call all the shots, it, it just doesn't work. But uh, it ended It ended for Jay Gruden with, <laughs> with Bruce Allen saying the culture is damn good. The culture really wasn't damn good. And uh, that brought in Ron Rivera, and it ends, you know, this way. Um, I guess – you know, you look at uh, what happened with Joe Gibbs. That was stability, I suppose, although he had two losing seasons and uh, you know, horrible, horrible situation in his last year where Sean Taylor was murdered and he had to deal with that. Um, I mean, it's just a, an organization that has, has really hurt itself in many ways and then has had, you know, circumstances beyond their control like that. Uh, so it, it is a new day. And the the big thing that's uh, that's going to happen is you've got adults in charge uh, who think uh, forward, who think ahead. It's always the people who don't see the now, but see the future who are the most successful. And this, this may be, be a successful move. It may not, you know, it's, it's not like, it's not like Josh Harris has a has a collection of NBA championship rings from the Philadelphia 76ers or a bunch of Stanley Cups from the J- Devils. You know, he's he's a good owner, he appears to be, but he's not he's not the greatest owner in sports and he's he's trying some new things. So this is out of the box thinking that they have hired the former Golden State Warriors general manager Bob Myers and the former Vikings general manager Rick Spielman to Meet with the ownership group, which includes Harris, Mitch Rails, Magic Johnson, and David Blitzer, and they will all sit down and they will try to hire the right people, the right head of football operations and a new head coach. That's the way this thing is going to move forward, and that is much different than the way it's operated in the past when you'd see a coach fired and you go, well, who's the next big name that he's going to chase you know, is he going to hire a general manager? No, he's not going to hire a general manager because Danny likes to meddle. Danny liked to come off his yacht and tell him which quarterback to draft. Oh, yes, Dwayne Haskins. He went to high school with my son. Take him. And we saw how that worked out and ultimately a, a terrible tragedy as he was killed uh, in a highway accident after uh, being caught and playing for the for a team that should have gotten his career back on track, the Pittsburgh Steelers. So um, there's all that. I'm, I'm just – you know, flipping through um, the various comments that are coming out of the locker room. Sam Cosme, uh, who is probably going to stay. You know, there aren't going to be that many holdovers on this team. A lot of free agents. Some of them they'll just say goodbye to. I mean, other than Terry McLaurin and, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe a handful of others. Uh, you're, you're not going to see – you're not going to see too many guys on this team five years from now, three years from now, who are on this roster now. Cosme may be one of them. And he said, I wanted to run the ball more. We needed more balance. Please, let's run the rock. <laughs> Eric Bieniemy comes in, and he's coming from Kansas City, where you have Patrick Mahomes, and you can throw the ball all the time, as they did this year. They led the, the league in passing attempts. And you're going to try and, and put that on Sam Howell, who winds up being sacked 65 times and throws 21 interceptions. Remember last year when uh, Martin Mayhew, I think it was Mayhew, who said this, we want to be 2-1 to one run-to-pass ratio. And people said, oh, what are you, nuts? And Scott Turner was the offensive coordinator. He took the fall for last year. They scored eight more points this year under B enemy. So how did that work out? Yeah, didn't really work out. Uh, let's see if I can find some more comments. Again, I'm just uh, – Flipping through Twitter here, uh, Charles Leno said, we need to have a standard set here. Starts at the top, said they really ne- never established that here. Uh, he came from Chicago, so he hasn't really been a, a part of a, a, a hugely successful operation. But uh, you know, I'm sure we'll see more and more comments that are that are coming out of uh, coming out of Ashburn today as the players react. And at some point, uh, we may get something from Ron Rivera. This is uh, Rivera from last week, and I think it's it, it's important to, to play these as we look back. He also said something yesterday uh, to Ed Werder, which I will get to, but uh, he said, he made a comment to Ed Werder, which sounded to me like he was throwing Eric Bieniemy uh, under the bus. Uh, let me see if I can find that from yesterday. I put out a lot of tweets yesterday and got into some, some Twitter wars with people. Here it is. Ron Rivera said to Ed Werder, who was covering the game for ESPN yesterday. I guess they had a private conversation before the game. And uh, he, he asked Rivera about Howell, who went into the game 
with 61 sacks, came out of it with 65, but uh, said about him leading the NFL in, in interceptions and sacks taken, uh, quote, this is from Ron Rivera to Werder, a lot of being pressed into things, and that's on us because you fall behind, you start to press a little too soon, you start airing it out, and you really should just try and stick to the game plan. That's, to me, throwing the enemy under the bus because, remember, Rivera, as he was an administrator, remember he said he was more of an administrator for three and a half years, left the offense entirely up to the enemy. And he said, we should be sticking to the game plan and we're airing it out. Well, that, to me, is a shot. Not that the enemy didn't deserve it, making a rookie quarterback go through all that, but... You know, that's kind of passing the buck. Uh, this is this is from last week, and, uh, you know, he knew he was going to be gone. There's no question about that. But, you know, you have to put up a facade to, to make people believe, hey, I'm going to try and lead this team out on the field against Dallas. We're going to do our best to win. Uh, this is about what he has been doing in the second half of the season. You know, that's what I'm here for is, uh, is to coach. I've, I've gotten an opportunity to coach. You know, there was a long period of time that I I did a lot of managing. And, um, you know, in, in the last four and a half, five weeks, it's really been about coaching. So it's, you know, just keeping focus on that has been something that I've tried to do and just stay where I, where I am. You know, that old expression, be where your feet are. Well, your, your feet have been standing there like a statue uh, watching loss after loss accumulate. Uh, since taking over as defensive coordinator, the defensive signal caller, this is what Ron Rivera's defense did. They gave up 45 points to the Miami Dolphins at home. They gave up 28 points to the Rams on the road. They gave up 30 points to a Jets team, which was down to its fourth or fifth quarterback, I think fifth quarterback. (laughs) They gave up 30 to them. They gave up 27 against the 49ers who weren't trying to roll it up, and they gave up 38 yesterday to Dallas. So uh, that coaching only wasn't working out for you either. And this was, this was really the epitaph on his career, why it didn't work out. Um, And he's right to a large degree, but I would remind you that the Steelers are in the playoffs. The Steelers have 10 wins and they're going there with Mason freaking Rudolph. Okay. So there is something to what Rivera says here, but keep in mind, it doesn't necessarily mean that you finish four and thirteen. That's probably the, been the biggest crux of it all is trying to find that guy. I mean, that's the hardest thing for anybody. It doesn't matter whether you're here uh, or at your one of the other places that are looking for that guy. I mean, you, you know, you're fortunate if you get a head coaching job where there's a guy, you better relish that and you better succeed. I'll tell you that right now. Um, you know, and, and and I've said this before, if if you know, a guy like Alex Smith, if he never gets hurt, I'd never come here because I, I think Jay and what they were doing would have continued. I mean, you get a guy like that, man, you you run with it. I promise you that. Um, it would have been cool to have a guy like that. It really would have because, you know, I think there's a lot of talent in that room. I think there's some good playmakers. Um, you know, in the last four weeks, we've only given up three sacks. So there's there's some potential there. The, the, you know, to have a guy that's, that's been there, that's been developed, that, that's, that's pretty cool. I, I promise you that, that, that if you go there, you're, you're a head coach, and you got to have success. Right. You should. Have these last four years changed your perspective on that position? And then as part of that, has it changed how you coach the other players who have to deal with the rotation of quarterbacks, like the receivers as they yeah. deal with multiple starters? Well, I, I know this, um, you know, just reflecting on it, the, uh, the biggest thing is just how important that position is. I mean, I was fortunate. In Carolina, we, we, we had our guy, and, and for seven seasons he was phenomenal. Unfortunately, the, the shoulder injury, I think, is probably the, one of the biggest things that, that really just threw him off track. I mean, he, he was as, as good as anybody, and he, he, he showed it. Um, you know, and then – Trying to find that guy is, is Nikki. As your, your quest to your question, it, it is that is the position. I mean, and you see why you know such an emphasis is, is being made on on protecting that guy. Why you know these guys are getting paid the way they're getting paid, and and you know if you're fortunate enough to have that guy. I mean, I know last year everybody gave me a little bit of grief when I asked me about what's the difference, and I said quarterback. I mean, trust me, it is, it is. Yeah, but it was your hand-picked quarterback, Carson Wentz. 
And Wentz won a game yesterday <laughs> against the, the 49ers who didn't have anything to play for. They already clinched the top seed. But, uh, yeah, Carson Wentz back on the field with the Rams. Uh, he won a game. So, uh, yes, it is all about finding that quarterback. And if you're going to be a championship team, you got to find your quarterback. Now, as the 49ers are proving, you may be able to do that with the last pick of the draft. Brock Purdy may win a Super Bowl this year. So you don't know where you're going to find him. And they've, they whiffed. You know, they, they moved up to the number three spot to take Trey Lance. And Trey Lance, I don't even think he was active yesterday for the Cowboys if he's still on the roster. They, they missed. But they kept swinging, and they, they eventually found their guy with a, with a good front office. And I think that's, that's where this new leadership group is going to start to look. They're going to look in Baltimore, and they're going to look in San Francisco and, and find people who come out of that organization. There's, there's lists all over. Albert Breer put one out yesterday. I think Peter King will probably have a bunch of suggestions in his column today. I haven't gone through that yet. But there, there are names out there. But that's where you generally go shopping. You go shopping in the places where people have had success. Uh, let me get a little more to uh, be enemy here. Um, there was a period of time this season where we're talking about, hey, you know, maybe if Ron Rivera goes, they keep Eric B. Enemy as the head coach and he continues to develop Sam Howell. Well, Sam Howell regressed and Eric B. Enemy, uh, I'm not saying that he's not a good offensive coordinator and with the right people like like a Patrick Mahomes, he looks a lot different than he did here, but the, the bloom is off of his rose as well. Um, this is Howell, who uh, I, I think would have to realize at this point that he's got to be fighting for his career. That, you know, if, if the season would have ended in October, you know, maybe he goes into next year as number one. Well, that's not the case. Um, this is how yesterday, this is before Rivera got fired, but everybody knew it was going to happen, uh, about getting the opportunity that probably wouldn't have come anywhere else in the NFL, that, that things had deteriorated so much with the whiffs on quarterbacks from Fitzpatrick to Wentz to you know, have to use Taylor Heineke, who they stumbled upon only because of COVID. He was the COVID quarterback, uh, to using a fifth-round pick in the last game of the year. That's the only time he got on the field last year, to going into this year as the number one and starting all 17 games. With Coach Rivera, you're just, just forever grateful that you know he gave me an opportunity. Um, you know, I think I knew I was, I was lucky to get an opportunity as a fifth-round draft pick to be a starter, um, and I'm just thankful to him that he, 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 he had given me this opportunity. Sam, at the beginning of the season compared to the end, do you feel like you've proven that you're a starting quarterback in this league? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think I've definitely shown at times that I can do it. You know, I think, you know, obviously there were some ups and downs and at times I wasn't playing good ball this year. Um, but I think I've shown I can do it. You know, I just got to try to continue to, you know, get better. Um, and, you know, it, this offseason will be good for me just because I have a, a year long of tape. You know, I have a, a year of film just to go back and, and watch and, you know, try to learn and just try to, see what I need to focus on this offseason and try to see the things that I can get better at. Um, so that, that'll be something I'm looking forward to. Shown at times that I can do it. And that is the big leap that every quarterback has to make. I'm sure if you look at tape of, of any quarterback who got a start in the NFL, even backed up, there are throws that you look at on tape and go, wow, look at that. He made that throw. And, and Hal continues to do that. But the game is consistency. And the game is not making mistakes. And it's not throwing 21 interceptions and taking 65 sacks. And so until he gets to that point, I don't think he's in the discussion of being that guy, as Rivera put it. This is about Eric bien I'm going to play this, and I'm also going to play what Logan Thomas said. And remember, we go back to training camp. Ron Rivera did this throughout the four years he was here. He would often put his foot in his mouth. And he did that with bien when he said, you know, some players have come to me and complained about how tough Eric is. He went, what? Really? And that 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 set off fireworks. Like really, people are going, and, and the coach is throwing the enemy under the bus before the season gets underway. Uh, this is how referencing the coaching style of the enemy, um, and you know he's got to think. Well, I benefited from it, even though the the season you know fell off a cliff at the end. Uh, I got a chance to start sixteen games and got chance to continue to play because of this guy here's how you know he's challenged me um he's challenged me every single week and he's helped me grow as a player he's helped me grow as a person um but he, he's just a very demanding coach 
Um, and at the end of the day, he truly wants what's best for his players. Um, and, and that's something that we can all truly appreciate is how much he, he truly wants us to succeed. Um, so he, he challenges us. He, he, he was hard on us, um, but we wanted it that way. Um, he, he's a great leader, great man. Um, and it was just a pleasure being able to, to do this with him. But apparently not everybody wanted it that way. And we had heard maybe it was the running backs who were complaining about the enemy. The enemy, a former running back, maybe tougher on them. Well, we finally got a window into that yesterday. Logan Thomas, who may or may not be back next year. He's a, he's a, a serviceable tight end. It doesn't cost a lot of money, but um, I'm sure they're going to want to upgrade at that position. Uh, and he's getting up there. He's probably about 30 years old. This is this is Logan Thomas about Eric Bieniemy saying what I think nobody so far, uh, other than B- than Thomas, has said. Uh, I think we had our ups and downs with him. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I might be the only one to say it, but I think we had our ups and downs. We had some good. We had some bad. Um, you know, it's just it's one of those things where something new comes in uh, after you've been used to something else for a couple of years, and it's sort of. Um, you know, sometimes you can bad heads, but I respect them for coming to work every day um, and being the same person every day. So, you know, if you have a person who comes in and be the same person, you can get on board with that. Yeah, yeah. so there's hardly a, uh, oh, God, I, I'd run through a wall for him. And we had some ups and downs. We had some bad, some good. Somebody comes in different the way he used to do it. I mean, not that he was replacing somebody who was successful, but, uh, yeah, that uh, that tells you a lot there, and I think – uh, Thomas was probably he's a former quarterback, you know. Maybe maybe that had something to do with it, but uh, obviously there was no uh, no love lost there. Uh, Logan Thomas and Eric Bieniemy, and then the last thing from Thomas from yesterday is you look at Houston last year. Uh, they won their last game of the year with Lovey Smith. Lovey Smith's middle finger on his way out the door was to beat a Colts team when they had a chance to have the number one pick. And they wound up with the number two pick. And that turned out to be C.J. Stroud, which turned out to be the best thing for them because now Houston is going to be in the playoffs. In fact, uh, they are playing the uh, the first game. Uh, I had, had time to go through all this this morning, but, uh, you know, just in case you're not up, up, up on, uh, on the schedule for this upcoming weekend. And, and the controversial Peacock game, which is Saturday night, Dolphins and Chiefs, which could wind up being a classic seen by relatively few people because not everybody has Peacock. So this is going to be a new thing for the NFL. They're putting a playoff game on Peacock. But, uh, yeah, Houston is going to uh, is going to start the weekend off. As, as seemingly, they always do. Like, every time Houston's in the playoffs, they always have the first game. Uh, they're playing Cleveland in the opener on Saturday at 4.30. So Houston with a home game. They, uh, they won their division, so they get to play the Cleveland Browns at home. And, uh, and that will kick off the playoffs. And so, you know, the question about the commanders is, well, you know, you stink this year. They stunk last year. This year they're in the playoffs. Could that be you next year? Here's Thomas. Absolutely. Absolutely. We just need the, the right guys in the right places. And um, at the end of the day, it comes down to what you do on game day. And if you play right, uh, you play winning football, you don't turn the ball over, you play good defense, and uh, then you have a chance to win every week. And, you know, that's what the Texans did. Now he uh, he kind of throws himself and the other players under the bus there. But he also says, you know, you, every team has good players. It's whether – you know, you execute. Some of it could be coaching. I don't know. Uh, but there's going to be new people in charge, and uh, and we'll see what what comes out of these recommendations from uh, from someone who's not been in the NFL before, Bob Myers. You know, you, you normally these jobs, these GM jobs, the the way you train for those is you you scout. It's a scouting job. You know, that's that's how these guys get started, and they move up the chain, and they get to be. There's like two two paths. Generally, if you played, you got a better chance to be a coach because you finish playing and then you move into some low-level position. You move up the chain, and you know, like Ryan Kerrigan had a great run here, and now he's the well, he was the assistant defensive line coach. I guess he is the or was the defensive line coach until the new staff comes in and and, and has their own people. Uh, and then you you know, if you're successful there, you keep moving up and eventually become a head coach. If Generally, if you haven't played, although there have been some who have been players in the league, but generally uh, you, you start out, it's hard. It's, you know, Charlie Cashley started here as an unpaid intern, you know, had to sleep at like the YMCA uh, and, uh, and worked his way up through scouting, assistant GM to Bobby Bethard and became 
uh, the GM of the team and later the uh, first GM of the Houston Texans. So, um, you know, that's generally the way that that type of thing uh, works out. It does not happen usually that and he's not going to be the general manager. I'm just saying that Bob Myers in an advisory capacity coming from the NBA, that's some new stuff. And uh, we'll talk more about that uh, certainly as the week goes on. I'm sure there'll be a news conference at some point this week. We'll go through what was said. Uh, At some point, we'll hear from Ron Rivera. But uh, the Rivera era has ended as he showed up for work today about 7.30. And uh, word was out shortly after 8 o'clock that he was out as head coach after four years. Coming up, it was 16 years ago today that Joe Gibbs retired for good. And there's some real tragic irony about the story that I'll deal with as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. we got Tony coming up at 11 o'clock. Things are happening fast and furious. Uh, a lot of it in the reporting stage, but if these guys are moving at this pace, <laughs> watch out. Uh, you know that Ron Rivera was fired earlier this morning. That shocked nobody. This was a shocker. Josh Harris has hired two prominent executives, one of them from the NBA, Bob Myers, former GM of the Golden State Warriors, put together four championship teams, six teams that went to the finals, and former Vikings GM Rick Spielman advisory. They're not going to be running the team necessarily. Spielman not necessarily going to be the GM. However, (laughs) these reports are coming out. uh, We reported this or we passed this along few minutes ago that uh, they've already requested interviews with Lions offensive coordinator Ben Johnson and their defensive coordinator Aaron Glenn, who I believe is African-American, which would fill the Rooney rule. So that, that may also be a part of the picture here in, in moving quickly. Also, this report that Myers has already reached out to agent Don Yee about Jim Harbaugh, who about 13 hours from now is going to be finished coaching at Michigan one way or another. He's either going to be national champion or he's going to be runner-up. But 12 or 13 hours from now, it's going to be all over for him for this year at Michigan. And he has hired Don Yee. Don Yee is Tom Brady's agent. He's got extensive experience in the NFL, is used to dealing with owners and front office people and and contracts. So, uh, again, I would not – and they can't do this. Although, although, think about this. I, I hadn't really thought of this. Oh, it just occurred to me. And, and maybe it should have. You can't talk to coaches from other teams about jobs for another two weeks. Jim Harbaugh, by midnight, is free to talk to anybody. He's not going to be in the NFL. Is not in the NFL. So if you want Jim Harbaugh, you could have him at a news conference tomorrow in Ashburn as the head coach. You can do that. You can hire a coach from college. The NFL people, and they're going to be in demand from other places. Atlanta is now officially looking with Arthur Smith out of a job last night. But if you want Jim Harbaugh, you can have Jim Harbaugh at midnight. So they could be talking to Don Yee this afternoon. And and Harbaugh you know, may get a text message from him. Uh, hey, uh, Jim, this is Don. Uh, call me after the game. <laughs> You know, and, and and here here's what I've got. Here's the structure I have in place. Uh, look it over. Uh, I I went through the fine print. I think you should take the job if you're interested. You know that kind of thing. So yeah, I mean all those things are are, are in play. Uh, it was 16 years ago today that Joe Gibbs resigned for the second time as coach of the then Washington Redskins, and it wasn't uh wasn't a spectacular second go round he went 31 and 36 one and two in the playoffs a, a far cry from four super bowl appearances and three super bowl championships with three different quarterbacks the first time around but you know with everything else Dan Snyder did over the years this was the one thing that he did right bringing back Joe Gibbs uh, at the beginning of the 2004 uh in January of 2004 so he was hired 20 years ago uh, for the second time, and then 16 years ago today, uh, he exited for the final time in Washington. And remember the first time he retired, which was March of 1993, Joe Gibbs was only 52 years old. And he talked about at that time how much he had missed with his family, two sons. And he said uh, one night he came home and he used to sleep two or three nights a week at his office because he was so involved in the game plan. And he came home and he noticed one of his sons had whiskers. And he said, I missed too much. He had some health issues. Um, 
things were changing in the NFL. A free agency was coming in. Some of the veterans that had been with him for a long time were going to have to go. So there was all that. But he said at the time, he said, and I remember this, he said, the most important thing that we're going to leave on earth are our children. And, you know, he, he was very religious and he felt like, you know, when I'm gone, what I'll leave behind are my sons. And he came back a second time. Uh, when the sons were grown and had grandchildren and the older son was running the race team, JD, uh, the younger son, Coy was involved in the race team. And, uh, now he had grandchildren and one of them contracted leukemia and he was very involved with his grandchildren. They all lived, you know, the families all lived together in that, in that Charlotte area. And he was the, he was the patriarch of the family. And he decided at the end of that incredible 2007 season where so much happened with the murder of Sean Taylor and then um, and then Jason Campbell, the starting quarterback, got hurt in the game after his death. And uh, Todd Collins, who had been in the league a long time but had barely played any games, came in, stepped in, won the last three games. They made it to the playoffs, and then they lost their playoff game at Seattle. And uh, with the health of his grandson, Uh, And with his age, 67, and, uh, you know, realizing that the team probably wasn't going in a in an upward direction at that time, weren't going to be Super Bowl contenders anytime soon. uh, He decided that it was going to be time to go and uh, delivered this in the news conference. And I'll I'll, I'll tell you about the the poignant, uh, ironic tragedy of this statement uh, in a moment. This is what Joe Gibbs said in leaving Washington for the final time 16 years ago today. I told Dan, I said, look, Dan, um, I think here's the best way for me to describe this. If somebody called you up, Tanya, your wife, and said, hey, there's something about our family. I need you to come home right now. You go home. For me, if we start into the football season and we start playing those games and something happened at home where I felt like I needed to be there, it's almost impossible for me to go. And so having said that, I did not feel like I could make the commitment to uh, stay here and coach. And so I'd made the decision and talked to Dan about it, um, about stepping out of football and um, getting a chance to spend more time with my family. I've said that um, the most important thing that Pat and I are going to leave on this earth are our kids, J.D. and Coy, our grandkids, and the influence we've had on others. And so I think it was time for me to live up to that and say, hey, football is super important, was important in my life. I felt like God wanted me here, but now is the time for me to go home. The, uh, the tragic irony of that uh, in saying that the most important things that he and his wife, Pat, were leaving on earth were his two sons, J.D. and Coy. And J.D. died of, a, of a, an illness, a, uh, a, 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 neuro- a neurological uh, illness uh, at age 49, and Coy died in his sleep at the age of 49. And you look back on that statement 16 years ago today where he talked about, you know, they were the ones who would succeed him on earth, and they died. Both of them died uh, before he did. Joe Gibbs was there yesterday uh, at the game. The grandson who had leukemia, I believe he's totally in remission now. I think his name is Jackson, named after Joe Jackson Gibbs. And, uh, and he has carried on the family legacy, and the grandchildren are involved in the race team now, and he can find some solace in that. But, but, but think about that. You know, the two times that he decided to leave coaching the first time around to be more with his sons, the uh, younger son, Coy, was at that time playing linebacker at Stanford, wanted to see him play. Uh, Gibbs got into television for a while and then more involved in the race team. And then the, uh, and then the, 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 the elder son dying uh, not long before he won Daytona uh, a second time, about five or six years ago. And then uh, to lose the other son, Coy, uh, it's just, it just has to be the most devastating thing. I know it's the most devastating thing. I'm, I'm the parent of two, two children. It's, it's unimaginable. And, uh, you know, you look back at that uh, at the time. Now, what followed was the usual chaos of this organization. If you remember, uh, the candidates in line to replace him at the time reportedly were Greg Williams, who was on his staff, 
Uh, they quickly, uh, you had Vinny Serrato say things like that were not true, like Greg Williams had criticized Joe Gibbs, which was nonsense. He was out. Al Saunders, who had been an offensive assistant under Gibbs uh, with the 600-page playbook, he didn't get the job. Uh, they were going to talk to Bill Cower, who decided to stay in television, and they had to talk to, uh, talk to other people. As it turned out, uh, they had gone ahead and they had hired Jim Zorn, which was just ridiculous. And Zorn was the offensive coordinator. He'd never risen above quarterbacks coach in Seattle. And he was told that when there was going to be a change that Jim Mora Jr. was taking over the next year. And he said to him, I'm not, I'm not keeping you as quarterbacks coach. He came here to be the offensive coordinator. And when they waited until after the Super Bowl, remember the Giants won their Super Bowl that year. That was the, uh, that was the year that they beat the unbeaten Patriots in the Super Bowl. The, uh, the great David Tyree catch. Uh, they waited until afterwards to talk to Steve Spagnola about taking the job. And Spagnola goes, nah, I'm not interested. So they hired Jim Zorn and told to call him up at the park where he was going over game film, I guess. And he said, Do you know, we want you to interview. He went out and he bought a suit and he showed up at Gibbs house or at Snyder's house, got the job. And I remember the news conference, the famous, you know, our, our guys are going to be uh, just like the uh, team in maroon and black. And Snyder chimes in yellow. And I go, oh God, we got a problem already. And Gibbs was there. I remember Gibbs there, not, not sitting by the way, uh, up, up front. He was sitting just in the audience and he was more casual than you'd seen him before. He wasn't wearing a, a tie. I just, it just seemed like, Ooh, you know, he kind of knew this wasn't going to work and, uh, and it did not. And, uh, and now we reach this day exactly 16 years later and they're looking for a new head coach, but things seem to be in a much better place for this organization than they were 16 years ago when Gibbs walked away. His final career numbers, 171 and 101, 17 and 7 in the playoffs, a career win percentage of 629, ranks him third all-time, I think this is still the case, third all-time behind George Hallis and Don Shula among coaches with 125 wins. Belichick may have passed him by now, but uh, apparently uh, Snyder, Spent until like 2.30 in the morning trying to get Gibbs to change his mind before that announcement. And uh, and Snyder said about Gibbs' recent work that he had him in the right direction. And Gibbs said, I want to see it finished. Well, sorry, Joe, 16 years later, it's still not finished. But uh, what a career he had and what great joy he brought to Washington and what great tragedy uh, he has suffered in his life in the years that followed uh, that second resignation 16 years ago today. Uh, Sad over the weekend to hear this. Jack Squirek passed away at the age of 64. Uh, And we're coming up on the 40th anniversary of of his play. This was, and again, you know, you look at the history of of the uh, commander's organization. It's hard to get your head around this, but this was a dynasty in the making when this happened. Uh, In 1982, after they had started the year before under then rookie head coach Joe Gibbs, 0-5, they turned it around, finished 8-8, they go into the 1982 season. They win their first two games. There's a two-month strike, and the players stay together. And they come back from the strike, and they finish the season 8-1. and one. Yeah, because we only played nine games. And they rolled through the playoffs thanks to John Riggins carrying the load. They win the Super Bowl against the Miami Dolphins. And in 83, they're better. They lose two games by one point both on Monday Night Football. They covered the spread every week. Riggins is even better than he was the year before. And they beat, they beat I think it was 51-7 to seven that they beat the Rams. And then they had gone up on a, San Francisco with a young Joe Montana. They'd gone up 21 nothing and had to get a field goal from Mark Mosley to win 24-21. They go to the Super Bowl, and now they're being – crowned as a dynasty like hey you know uh, the number of teams at that point that had won back-to-back Super Bowls I think it was the it was the Miami Dolphins and maybe nobody else they may have been the only other team to win back-to-back at that point and uh and they uh and they go and uh and they play a uh, a team that they had beaten in a wild comeback game the Raiders, they'd beaten them at RFK Stadium. Joe Washington caught a touchdown pass at the end on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And now they're going to take care of the Raiders, who they are favored to beat. And nothing goes right. And they're down, I think, with 12 points, something like that, at the at entering half, near halftime. And they're backed up against their own goal line. And the thing to do is to just run out the clock and get yourself set for the second half. 
That's not what happened. Joe Gibbs tells Joe Theismann to call Rocket Screen, and here's how it sounded as called by the great Bill King, the voice of the Raiders. With 12 seconds to go in the half, trailing 14 to 3. Theismann back, looks off to the left, and he fires it off there. Intercepted! Jack Squarek! Touchdown, Raiders! I don't believe it! Holy Toledo! <laughs> well, I laugh now. I wasn't laughing then. Uh, and that was pretty much the ball game. Uh, they lost the game 38-9. to uh, It was just a, a disastrous day for Washington. And the play that was called, the rocket screen, the defensive coordinator, forget his name, for the Raiders had sniffed that out. And he was trying to get the attention of Matt Millen, who was on the field, to say, hey, rocket screen is coming. In those days, they didn't have the communication that you have now between the defensive signal caller and, and the defensive coordinator, you know, much like it is between the offensive coordinator and the quarterback. The, the technology wasn't there. So they're trying to get his attention. It's a rocket screen. They can't get Millen's attention. So he says, hell with it. Squirek, go in. They're going to run the rocket screen. Squirek goes in the game. He sees it. He intercepts the pass. And, and that, was, that was pretty much the ball game there. His uh, career was, was short. Um, he was a second-round pick out of Illinois, 1982, was with the then Los Angeles Raiders, 1982 to 1985, and then played two games for the Miami Dolphins in 1986. And uh, from what I read, he had a, a brief illness and passed away at the age of 64. But if you say the name Jack Squirek to a fan of this football team for as long as I have been or even maybe a shorter period of time, maybe, at, well, at least 40 years, obviously, at least 40 years if you're a fan of this team, and you hear Rocket Screen, you think immediately of Jack Squirek. And uh, Jack Squirek dying over the weekend at the age of 64. Rest in peace. Tony's coming up next. We got the uh, news conference for Josh Harris this afternoon. I'll have plenty of react to that and other things around this organization. Things are happening fast, and we'll have lots of react tomorrow at 9 a.m. Tony next. I'll see you tomorrow.